There's a big difference between can I shoot and must I shoot. Hi, everybody. John McLaughlin, your current chair of the Iowa Firearms Coalition. Welcome to another Warrior Wednesday. And our special guest today is Des Moines Area Attorney and Firearms Instructor, Amanda Vogel-Robinson. And Amanda, thanks for joining us. And give folks just a little snippet on uh, who you are and how you got into this firearms world. Sure, sure. I'm one of those kind of stereotypical Midwestern kids that grew up around guns. Uh, but as a little girl, that's not really something that was a, of, of a major interest to me at the time. Uh, but, you know, as we get older, we get wiser, hopefully. Right. And so as I uh, grew up, got married, brought a child home, uh, I'm holding this little baby in my arms. And I realize uh, I am completely and totally responsible for this child's safety. And how am I going to be able to keep him safe? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I had this kind of flashback to a self-defense class that I'd taken in a local police department a few years ago, mm -hmm. uh, at this point, several years ago. And, you know, it was a fairly extensive self-defense class uh, compared to some that are out there. The fourth night of the class, it's supposed to be this big empowering thing where you get to beat up these guys in padded suits and put everything that you learned into action. And I kind of came away from that with the opposite feeling. I kind of came away from that realizing I can hit this guy as hard as I possibly can, and it's barely going to phase him. And I even had that conversation with one of the guys afterwards and said, hey, you know, would, would anything that I did have actually stopped you mm -hmm. if you weren't wearing the padded suit, right? And uh, he said, well, you had, you had one kind of good one that you got in there, you know, hit me across the jaw. And I thought to myself, I, I don't think that's enough. Like if somebody is really intent on attacking me or my family, I think I need some extra help. I think I need some extra tools. And, and having that background and not being scared of firearms, I think was a good thing because I realized a gun is one of those tools that can help me, especially as a woman, uh, be physically equal or even superior to a man and actually help defend myself, defend my life, defend my child and my family. And so uh, that was really what got me started down the road of taking firearms classes Soon after became an NRA, NRA certified instructor, got my USCCA uh, instructor certification. And because I do have a, a background in the law, have a special interest in where firearms and the law intersect and realized, especially coming into 2017 when Stand Your Ground was, mm -hmm. was becoming a thing here in Iowa, that there's going to be a lot of people out there with misconceptions about what this means. And so I actually... Uh, got yet another instructor certification from the Law of Self-Defense program and built an Iowa-specific self-defense law class. One of the common things uh, with the Iowa Firearms Coalition that we hear from those who oppose firearms is with Stand Your Ground, it's going to be the Wild West, or with uh, Constitutional Carry, it's going to be the Wild West. <laughs> uh, is that what you found in, in your research <laughs> and your work so far? Not at all. Uh, and in fact, it's interesting, you know, and I'm sure you know, I'm sure you've probably said this before. We're, we have, what, 25 states now that are constitutional carry states. This is not a unique new thing anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and, and really, I'm finding people who are asking the right questions and, and, and signing up for the classes. We've actually been scheduling more law classes lately, mm -hmm. uh, I think, because people are starting to realize, OK, now I have a gun. I need not just to know how to use it, which is what we teach you in the basic permit classes and the basic lessons and so forth, you know, how to use it, how it functions, what are the safety rules? That's all very important to know, right? But the next question then is, when am I legally justified to use that gun in self-defense? Mm -hmm. And there are not enough people who know the answer to that question, right? Uh, a few slides into my law class, one of the pictures that I show is the St. Louis couple uh, from 2020, summer of 2020, right. when the protesters broke down the gate to their gated community and are marching through their neighborhood in front of their house, and they felt very threatened, right? And I think we all kind of understand why they felt threatened, but the, the famous photo of them is, is them standing in their yard, the husband's holding a rifle, the wife is holding a pistol, and the muzzles are pointed every which away, right? I, and I believe that violates uh, the rule of don't let your muzzle cover anything you're not willing to destroy. <laughs> Yes, 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 it does. Right. And they're, so, they were yeah. attorneys. <laughs> right. So the, the firearms instructor in me is just cringing because 
that's just so, so bad. And then the legal instructor in me is cringing even more because I have to say, these two people who are attorneys don't even realize that they're committing aggravated assault. And that's a very serious crime. Um, so that's something that I think people don't think about enough, like how quickly something that they consider to be defense mm -hmm. can cross that line into, oh, no, now you're actually a criminal yourself because you didn't know the rules and you didn't do it right. So it's important to know the rules way ahead of time, because in your moment of crisis, that's a really bad time trying to be sorting things out. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's one thing. You know, I also help uh, run our Armed Women of America chapter at Crossroads. I hammer that into those ladies and I hammer it into all of my students, right? I tell them that my goal is to get you thinking about these situations ahead of time so that you can formulate some kind of a plan. Because if you wait until you're in the situation to formulate the plan, that's too late, right? It's not going to be a well thought out plan. It's probably not going to be the best option. Um, and that's why I really encourage folks, you know, think through these things. When you read these news stories, when you watch you know, the active self-protection videos on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Those things are valuable tools to get your wheels and your brain turning, right? You have right. to think through these things ahead of time. Um, another famous quote from another famous instructor, you know, your, your brain won't go where your body hasn't been, right? Mm -hmm. Your body won't go where your brain hasn't been. I flipped that around. So you have to have thought about these things ahead of time. Because if you wait till you're in the heat of that moment, you're, you're not going to make the best decisions under pressure. So you talk about a five-step checklist uh, that you train folks on to uh, delineate where it might be a gray area or where it's absolutely I must shoot to save my life or that of those folks around me. Right, right. Kind of the, the, the basic, most basic way of thinking of it is, and this was a quote from Tom Givens just this past weekend at the range master class that I took. You know, you have to ask yourself, if I don't shoot this guy, am I going to die or am I going to suffer serious bodily injury? If the answer to that question is no, then don't shoot. That's the simplified, that's a very simplified version of it, right? In the law class, we run people through basically a checklist of five things, five elements of self-defense. The first one is innocence, right? You have to be an innocent party to be able to claim self-defense. And you hinted at this, I think, a little bit earlier. You know, when Stand Your Ground was coming into effect, a lot of people thought this isn't going to make Iowa, the Wild West, and you're going to have, you know, drug dealers legally shooting other people. Well, is a drug dealer an innocent party? Mm -hmm. No, right? So that that kind of rules out that concern right there, because you have to be an innocent party to act in self-defense. Yeah, don't start a bar fight and then bring out your gun. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly, right? We've got innocence, we've got imminence. This is a big one, right? You don't get to Defend yourself with deadly force unless your life is in immediate, imminent danger. The threat has to be about to happen to you right now. And, and people, I think, get a little bit confused. You, you see somebody 100 feet away with a knife. What is a knife? It's an impact weapon. They have to be close to you to use it. So is somebody 100 feet away from you an imminent threat? Not yet. Is it somebody you need to be concerned about and watching? Absolutely. But the threat's not yet imminent. So you don't get to use deadly force unless your life is in danger right now, right this second. So we've got innocence, we've got imminence, we've got proportionality. You don't get to use more force than you're being threatened with. So if somebody's threatening to slap you across the face, is that a deadly force threat? No, it's not. So you don't get to respond by drawing your gun because what is drawing your gun? That's a threat of deadly force. Those two things are not equal. Those two things are not proportional. So you only get to defend yourself with deadly force if you yourself are being threatened with deadly force. Uh, so that's proportionality in a nutshell. There's obviously a lot of uh, other details involved in these that we go into much, much more in depth in class, but that's the super quick version. So we've got innocence, imminence, proportionality, avoidance, right? And this is the big one that where stand your ground comes into play. And the big misconception that a lot of people have is that stand your ground is its own defense. You know, oh, I'm going to walk into court and claim that I stood my ground. That's not how this works. Mm -hmm. Stand your ground really only impacts 
one element of the five elements of self-defense. You still have to be innocent. The threat still has to be imminent. Uh, you still have to respond proportionally. You still have to act reasonably. But all Stand Your Ground does is say, hey, look, if you fulfill all of these other elements of self-defense, if you happen to not see the fire exit behind you where you maybe could have exited, we're not going to hold that against you. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that I teach that really is, once again, from a very conservative perspective of, gosh, if you can get the heck out of Dodge in a situation like that, that's what you should do. Yeah. You know, if you can avoid these situations, you absolutely should. Because rule I num really try rule number one in gunfighting is if you can avoid a gunfight, avoid it. <laughs> absolutely. Right. And so I think, you know, I teach it from a very conservative perspective of, you know, just because you can doesn't mean that you should. Mm -hmm. uh, you really have to think about, once again, think about in advance, how would your life change if you actually had to take somebody else's life, right? How are your neighbors going to look at you? How are your, how is your employer going to look at you? How are you going to look at yourself in the mirror, right? Um, if it's something that you can avoid, even if it would technically be legal for you to do, avoid it because you don't want to have to live with that for the rest of your life. So we've talked about avoidance. The last element is, is uh, reasonableness, right? It's this overarching element that kind of covers everything else like an umbrella. Everything you, have, you do has to be both subjectively and objectively reasonable. And when you read Iowa's self-defense statute, chapter 704.1, reasonableness is everywhere, right? Um, so you obviously, have a lot of things you have to be thinking about when you're in these situations. And once again, the time that you're actually in that situation isn't the time to start thinking about it. The time to start thinking about it is right now. Now you can be totally right on every one of the five points that you just went through. You can still end up arrested in the back of a police car, spending the night in jail, spending a lot of money. Uh, so th there's no guarantees that at least uh, eventually you know, this may be worked out, but initially there, there's a good chance you're going to go through a very uncomfortable time if you get to that point, correct? Absolutely. I mean, and we use, we use once again, examples from the news uh, when we talk about this. Another picture that I show in class is George Zimmerman. Mm -hmm. George Zimmerman was ruled to be legally justified in what he did in Florida. And from the evidence, I under absolutely understand why the jury came to that conclusion. Do I think that George Zimmerman would go redo some things differently if he could because of what happened in his life afterward? Absolutely. Right. He lives in hiding. He's unemployable. His wife divorced him, you know, pretty much financially ruined. And he lives in hiding. Is that a great outcome for him? I would say no, it's not. Honestly, same kind of true for Kyle Rittenhouse. Was he justified in what he did? I think absolutely legally, yes. But that kid's life is going to be forever changed. And that's not a good way to live your life. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, if you just look at it from the cost perspective, I was talking to a uh, criminal defense attorney recently at the uh, Second Amendment Day in February. He said, you're talking minimum six figures if I come in to try to defend. You can be totally right, but you know, you better at least have 100000 or more in the bank. You know, are you willing to bet your house on, on this uh, life death decision you have to make? So you better be, you know, this like, you know, 110% sure this, this is the right decision before going press. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Let's talk about some other things. I see you mentioned the videos uh, on the internet and you definitely can train your brain watching those videos. Mm -hmm. I see people that, that are in totally in the right. You know, someone comes into their store or their house or whatever, do they do their pew, pew, pew. The guy runs out the door. Okay, that, that's great. That's a win. But then they go out the door and chase the guy and fire a few more shots as he's running away. Now you definitely are into a gray area or maybe you're uh, looking at uh, charges yourself there. Absolutely. You know, and I even had a student ask this question in class. She said, you know, so do you mean to tell me if somebody broke into my house and raped me, if he's walking out the door, if he's walking across my front yard, I can't shoot him? And I said, no that makes you the judge, jury, and executioner. And that's not your role. And the reason for that is because if he's leaving, if he's walking away, the threat is no longer imminent. Or imminent, imminent. So that 
one element out of the five of self-defense is, is gone. And when one element is gone, your entire claim of self-defense is gone. So people really have to think, you know, a lot of people look at that situation and say, well, that doesn't sound, you know, morally right. I think I should be able to. You can think you should be able to, but that's not what the law says, right? right. And my job is to teach you what the law says. And whether you agree with the law or not, you don't want to go to jail. And so if you don't want to go to jail, this is how you don't go to jail. Don't don't do that. Yeah, and it's a fine line when you come to like property things like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, if, if someone has pulled a gun on you and they say, hand me the keys to the car, you know, if I'm not in a position where I can respond appropriately, I'll just hand them the keys because I can get another car. But, but right. you see a lot of times where people are, you know, somebody's walking out of their house with a TV and they, they burn that person down. But just give us a little education on uh, defending property. Right. You don't get to use deadly force in defense of property, period. End of story, right? There is a, a famous situation that happened in Iowa, I think back in the 1970s, where there was a, an, a seemingly abandoned house in a rural area. Uh, but there was still some, I guess, semi-valuable things that were kept in this house. I think it was a collectible glass jars or something, right? So there had been some, some robberies from this house, some burglaries from this house. And the owners of the house set up a 20 gauge shotgun on a spring trap mm. set up to go off when a back bedroom door opened. And they decided, you know, we just want to maim this person. We don't actually want to kill them. So they aimed it a little bit lower. And lo and behold, they took out somebody's legs and the trespassers sued and the trespassers won because those folks were using deadly force and defensive property. It was an unoccupied house. And this is true every, all, everywhere. And people say, oh, you can do that in Texas. Well, even in Texas, <laughs> it's a very, very limited rule. It's a very uh, specific situation. And even in Texas, I, it's not a good idea to do. The, the rule that you have to remember is you don't get to use deadly force in defensive property. Now, the example that you pointed out in terms of a carjacking gets a little interesting, right? Um, the law, self-defense law makes a pretty big distinction between occupied vehicles and unoccupied mm -hmm. vehicles. Mm -hmm. So if your vehicle is unoccupied, what is it? It's a simple piece of property and you don't get to use deadly force to defend it. If I'm at the gas station and my son is in the back seat, right. that's a whole different story. Right. And so obviously that's going to impact my decision-making and how I respond to that, because now I'm not just defending my property i'm defending my child's life who happens to be inside of that property yeah really good point uh a lot of companies out there ifc uses one that offers a uh, legal protection insurance uh representation however you want to call it it's different states look at it differently what are your thoughts on these uh, like concealed carry plans uh, that, that uh, well, USCCA mentioned them earlier. They have one. Mm -hmm. We use uh, firearms legal protection. What are your thoughts on having a policy like that to pay the bills just in case? Um, if you're not wealthy enough to self-insure, you absolutely need to do this. Um, I, I think, and there's, I think, like you said, a lot of great options out there. Uh, I have a plan myself. I'm actually considering getting a second one just because why not? Mm -hmm. um, different ones, you know, have different benefits and, and so on and so forth. But if you don't have, like you said, six figures laying around in your bank account and you don't want to mortgage your house, mm -hmm. you know, you got to be able to pay the upfront retainer fee to the lawyer. You've got to be able to pay bail, uh, assuming you can even get bail so that you're not sitting in prison, losing your job and all of these things. So, uh, Absolutely. I think that it's something you need to look into if you're a gun owner, and especially if you're somebody who is a concealed carrier, carries outside of your home. So uh, I don't want to get too much into politics here, but if you go to trial in a situation like this, or even if you don't, you know, you can get a whole bunch of persecution from one side or the other, uh, kind of depending on their politics. Are you seeing that come into play at all now? Um, I have not seen it personally, but the way that I talk to my students about that, I, I do try to address that now um, because everything, everything is so politically charged these days. Um, 
you know, and like you said before, you could be absolutely, totally justified in your actions. And, you know, the there's a mob outside the courthouse. Can that impact a jury? Mm -hmm. I think so. Um, so, yes, I think that's even more reason to a, a gun at a Supreme Court justice's house <laughs> or that. Yes. Yeah, right. right. But that's that's even more reason to be more careful to be more knowledgeable in what you can and what you can't do and to be more frankly hesitant to use any level of force because things can escalate very very quickly so you mentioned uh, early on that you just took a uh, tom givens range master instructor course so you've gone beyond you know kind of the nra is like the <laughs> the first step in the instructor world right. and you can move up the chain uh and i i was curious not many people take that class and show a hundred percent score. So congratulations, first of all, but uh, for folks that aren't familiar with this uh, instructor uh, certification, give us a little uh, kind of quick lesson on what you went through over several days for this. Yeah. So it, it really is kind of, I would say that the next level step beyond the basics, the, you know, you uh, NRA USCCA type of, of instructors courses. Um, he tells you up front, Tom Givens tells you up front, not everybody's going to pass this class. Mm -hmm. um, everybody who meets a certain standard will pass this class, but typically he has, I think around 15% or so in each class who don't pass. And we did have a few in our class this past weekend who, who didn't pass. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it is a lot of book learning, probably more book learning than, than any other instructor class that I've taken, but it also involves, uh, a true tests of shooting proficiency. I would say, once again, much more so than any of the other instructor level classes that I've taken. So we had a 200 and some page book that we have to memorize a lot of stuff out of. Um, we had to shoot an FBI qual to instructor standards, which is 90 percent or higher. Uh, we had to then shoot Tom Givens range master qualification, which is somewhat similar to NRA, but harder mm -hmm. because Tom really emphasizes uh, physiologically significant hits. Mm -hmm. So it's not the entire silhouette that counts like in the FBI qual. It's an right. eight inch circle that counts for full credit and the scoring goes down after that. Um, so I did 100% on the FBI. I did a 98.4 on the range master qual. And then you have a written test over the uh, classroom and book material that we that you've had to study for the last three days. Mm -hmm. And I managed to get 100% on the on the written test as well, which Tom mentioned was um, not all that common. He said there's maybe only been a dozen or so people who've, who've ever done that. So there were some other guys in the class who were really good shooters. And probably I think at least one of them beat me on the, the shooting scores, but I beat him in the written test. So. <laughs> so that means come train with Amanda, take her course. Yep. Uh, tell, tell us where folks can find you. Yeah, so the best place to go is check out uh, Crossroads website. We have a specific training website, iowaconcealedcarry.com. Like I said, we have permit classes on the calendar. We have the law classes on the calendar, which, once again, everybody should take. There's no shooting involved in it. So if you don't feel like you're very proficient yet, you can still come get this knowledge. It really is knowledge that every gun owner should have. Absolutely. And on behalf of the Iowa Firearms Coalition, of course, we want folks to uh, legally carry their firearm. But more importantly, even though it's not required by law, it should be required by your moral and ethical compass. Get significant training so that if you ever have to use it on that day, that uh, that you're well prepared and, and, and are prepared to, to carry the day. And you will not do that without a, a good base of training behind you. So Amanda, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Encourage folks to uh, get to the Crossroads website. And uh, thanks for being our uh, Warrior Wednesday today. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm, you bet.